ready, guys? Okay. Yeah. We're here today to remember the children who died in residential schools. We're starting here at the Anglican Church. Actually, the Anglicans and the Catholics were the ones who established the residential schools. But we remember these children. They all died in Anglican residential schools. They've never received a proper burial, and the murders have never been brought to trial. Margaret Seapass, age nine, beaten to death by a white supervisor at the St. Michael's Anglican Residential School in Alert Bay, December 1961. Burial site unknown. Joseph James, age 11, died after being sodomized by an Anglican priest at the Alert Bay Anglican Residential School, October 1949. Burial site unknown. Bernadette Thomas, age 6, disappeared at the St. George's Anglican Residential School, spring 1965. Albert Hans, age 14, starved to death, St. George's Anglican School, 1948, buried next to the school in a mass grave. Those are just some of the children who died in Anglican schools. You know, in Canada, not one person has ever been brought to trial for the death of a child in a residential school. This is what we have to change. We have to start changing that by alerting the conscience of the people here and all over this country. And that's why we're here today. One of the little known facts about the residential school policies was also to uh, not inform students of their uh, relatives' passings, whether it be your mother, your dad, uh, or you know, your grandfather, your grandmother. And, uh, that was one way of controlling the mind, right? You had the body there already, but uh, mentally, you know, if you did this, uh, this policy that was in effect at that time, you don't inform students of, uh, uh, of their relatives' passing, Mentally, that's when you've got them. And I remember going through that residential mental school. school that I attended. Sharing the pain of the Indian I'm residential school legacy. Poplar Hill. This is Poplar Hill. In Alberta? Or? No, this is in northern uh, northern Ontario. This is the one I'm talking about where I heard the news about my mother. Huh? This is the principal that gave me the news. This is where I heard it. Yeah. How long were you there? I was there for about a year, a year and a half, something like that. But um, the point the point is, this is where uh, they delivered the news about my mother's death, right? And they looked me right in the eye. They didn't say nothing. They just looked you in the eye at that time, right? Eh? Your mother's passed away. And, um, so you go into shock, right? And say, when? What? Where? Oh, she died about uh, six months ago. And you're going, huh? What? Well, how come? Anybody Like, how come I wasn't told? Right? Well, now I understand the policies. Um, Kevin and Ed talks about the policies that were set. And uh, now I understand, now I'm starting to get the total picture of what actually happened and how it came into, uh, how, it, how it affected my, uh, how it affected me and, and my family and the community. So, yeah. What's this place called? Uh, it's um, the Poplar Hill Residential School. It was run by the Mennonite Church. Mennonite yeah, Church, exactly, yeah. That's why they were able to set up these residential schools with such absolute control, because they were the only, you know, church and state were one, really, they still are. That's why they got away with this shit. United Church next, eh? It was made by kids in the downtown east side of Vancouver, native kids, and people in the Sweetgrass Center. And every time we did a church occupation or not, for the last three or four years, we took it into the church and stood outside the Vatican and other places with it, so. All over the world, people kind of struggling with the same stuff. Uh, and it isn't just, uh, it didn't just happen to native kids, but the same churches are doing the same crimes all over. So that's why we're doing an international tribunal. Where have you been on your all over England, Denmark, Slovenia, uh, Ireland. This is the third trip over there for me. And each time I go, I get bigger crowds all the time because more and more people are aware. Like we had hundreds of people in, in Dublin gathered outside the parliament um, to uh, you know demand that these churches not be exonerated anymore. You know, they, like in Canada, what the police have done in Ireland is they basically got together with the churches and said, okay, you don't, you don't have to, even pay a lot of money in compensation. Most of that is going to come from the government. Also, they uh, 
you can count on one hand the number of people ever gone to jail for any of these crimes, you know. So, I mean, literally 99% of priests who rape kids get away with it, and that's because of this kind of regime that's being set up with the churches outside the law, right? Right. So. How about your trip to Ottawa? It, oh, well, a couple of days ago I presented a summons to Prime Minister Harper, at least to his office, uh, asking that he appear, well, really requiring that he appear before a tribunal in London in September. Uh, of course, the next day he got voted down and his government fell. So uh, whether he gets elected or not, again, we're, we're going to present it to either him again or the next prime minister. Kevin, what happened with your with the time slot in the ministry? Is it still is there still a show called in the ministry? Or? No, they took over the time slot. Actually, uh, a native woman from Ganarji who was kind of leading the smear against me at the station took over the spot and is now running her own show. So I think it's part of the payoff. Um, but no, they cancelled Hidden from History. It was on the air for over nine years. And actually, a lot of the stories of the residential schools first began to surface on that program. Because uh, it was an open mic, anybody from the street could just come in, sit down at the mic and start talking. And we had lots of people come in, and that's where they, they first broke the news about all these crimes. So it was a real blow to people in our community to, to lose that program. There's two things going on. I got some people on the air who described seeing Mounties taking women out to the Picton farm, yeah. naming these Mounties who were involved in the disappearance of women. Yeah. And uh, right. ten minutes yeah. after that show ended, I was banned from the station. Yeah. Yeah. Just like that. Yeah. The other thing that went on, so it was partly that, it was also the fact that they fired two other programmers as well, because Jim Patterson, who's this multi-billionaire media mogul, yeah. Has, is in the process of acquiring co-op radio and there's been a secret deal in the works for over three years that the staff never told anybody about and basically what they did is they cleaned house and they got rid of anybody who might criticize that corporate takeover they're funding the station the CRTC changed the rules last year allowing corporations to fund public radio stations so that means that essentially they can buy them up and uh, you know anybody who might have the vector that is, is gone now from Co-op Radio, so it, and they changed the rules so you can't challenge the board members anymore, it's become really repressive. And uh, they're doing that across, there's this woman, Freya Zaltz, who uh, uh, is a lawyer for the Attorney General in British Columbia, who was placed on the board of, new board of directors at Co-op Radio, and she's also on the national body overseeing public radio uh, in, in Canada. So there, it's, a, it's a corporate government takeover of alternative radio. Kevin is the United Church, and I grew up in the United Church, and they just have a little white collar. But so this guy's got all his big robes and ribbons and so all his other things. This one? This is for the missing and murdered Aboriginal woman. This is white rim account. Oh, no, but it's got its cars. It's a cop, Metro cop, right on his car. It used to be a chaplain with the Toronto Police. That's the same guy. It's the same guy. came out last time glad handing everybody. I didn't shake his hand last time. I said, you know, if you if you really want to be, you know, friendly, why don't you go do the right thing and tell us where these children are buried? Remember these children before we start. Those who died in United Church Indian Residential Schools. Nora Jones, age four, disappeared at the United Church Alberni Residential School in the spring of 1970. Albert Gray, age 11, beaten to death by Principal Alfred Caldwell at the Housed Residential School, January 1938 for stealing a prune, burial site unknown. Sally Gardner, age 16, died during forced abortion after being made pregnant by a white staff member, United Church Alberni Residential School, March 1966, burial site unknown. Arnold Massey, age 12, died at the Mohawk Institute in Brantford, 1960, cause of death unknown, buried behind the school. Shirley Tatouche, age 10, died after rape by a priest, Catholic school, Fort Albany, 1955. Now we're here at this United Church because in 1925, this is where the first convention of the United Church was held. And this is where the plan and the model for the residential school was adopted right here in this building. So we're here symbolically to say that nothing has changed in all these years after all the apologies, after all the words, not one person has ever been brought to trial in Canada for the death of a child when over 50,000 of them died. One of them being this little girl right here. 
Vicky, Vicky Stewart was nine years old in 1958. She was hit on the back of the head by a woman called Ann Kaniski, who worked at the United Church Edmonton Residential School. She was buried at her home, and no investigation was ever done. The cause of death was listed as tuberculosis when two eyewitnesses saw her killed by Ann Kaniski, an employee of the United Church of Canada. For four years, the family's been trying to get the church to respond and has received no response. The RCMP also refused to investigate because they claim the perpetrator is dead. These are the, some of the things that we're trying to arouse the conscience of the church about to say, you can't talk about healing and reconciliation if you do, don't do the most basic thing, which is give the children a proper burial and bring to justice the people responsible. Because you notice in all these big cathedrals, after we show up, it, it tends to go down. People read it and go, well, shit, maybe I shouldn't come here, right? So that's what we want, right? Once they, you hit them in the collection plate, then they'll, they'll sit up and take notice. At 3 o'clock, maybe your schooling is finished, but now you have to go and you, you have to do your religious studies. And then you have to go in, in it's dinner time, and your dinner is not what you want. You can't ask for whatever. All you get is the mush or whatever they give you and then it's praying time again and then it's you know getting down to bedtime and at night you're told that it's uh you know if you, if you get out of bed at night then uh the devil's gonna get you you have to stay in your bed all night because that devil he he's out there and he's gonna get you so the kids they, they end up by if they have to go to the bathroom you know they end up by peeing their beds and then in the morning they're, they're humiliated on this humiliation line where they uh their sheets are wrapped around them the wet cold sheets are wrapped around them and they have to run this gauntlet with the, all the other kids laughing at them. And, and nobody wants to go through it, but everyone's happy that it's not them this time. Yeah. So they're, they're wetting their beds at night, and they, they hear this stuff going on in other beds, whether the priests or the nuns are, are molesting the kids or taking them out of their beds at night. And they can hear all this going on. You can hear the kids crying at night, wanting their homes, wanting their moms and dads, their brothers and sisters. Um, and then, you know, then the, the day routine just continues. And depending on the school you'd have, you know, the bells to wake you up and the bells to tell you when it was time to do this and do that. Um, I think that's why it's really important to make that connection though between apartheid here and apartheid with what's happening to the Palestinians. I think we gotta go up to the Catholic Church, don't we? Yeah. You're on Indian land, buddy. You're on Indian land. You're on Indian land. You're on native land. What do you mean it's your property? You're on native land. I made the comment. Yeah. Hey, my friend. Hey, my friend. Hey. 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 He's the one that made that comment. Uh, this guy should just be shot or oh, the that shooting guy from thing. Last yeah, time, yeah. That guy right there. Yeah, yeah. 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 It says uh, back then they, they used to just all shoot you guys. Too bad we Gary, can't do that today. Can you hold that? So that can guy right there, bro. Right? Yeah. You... <laughs> you better not mess, buddy. <laughs> We're here. <laughs> Look at me, man. We're here. Okay. Yeah, good attitude, buddy. Twice a month. Wow. Security guy came out and said, the priest is very upset. And I said, well, we're very upset. The children died in your schools, right? He just yeah. kind of 